great storytellers are liars. Everybody knows it. Nobody cares. As long as the stories have intrigue, adventure, romance. But what if the storyteller takes it one step too far? What if he starts living out his fantasies? Suddenly, it's not just entertainment anymore. Chances are, somebody's going to get hurt. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. November 6, 2002. Sergeant Bill Napier is in charge of the Major Crimes Unit in Winnipeg. There's just been a bank robbery. Napier and his squad interview witnesses and secure the scene. Teller Mary Anderson tells police the robber didn't seem nervous at all. The teller is, is extremely traumatized. She fears not only for her own safety, uh, but for the safety of her child, because uh, this was a national take your child to work day, and her son was present in the bank at the time of the robbery. Though terrified, she had the presence of mind to slip a dye pack in with the bills. Dye pack is uh, an explosive device that's uh, placed in the cash uh, to detonate once it leaves the bank. And the objective of this, obviously, is to destroy some of the cash and put evidence from the bank robbery onto the suspect. In the alley behind the bank, Police soon discover the dye pack has done its job. They find uh, clothing that has been discarded by the suspect and the actual firearm that was used in the robbery. Police hope to find fingerprints and traces of DNA. They send the evidence to the RCMP for analysis. Sergeant Napier studies the bank surveillance tapes but all they reveal is that the robber is heavy set. Typically in, uh, in our city, we, we have a lot of robberies that occur uh, by substance abusers, crack addicts that are uh, much thinner than this intimidating suspect. Because of the suspect's size, he's dubbed the Fat Bandit. Police track down and interview anyone who fits the description. Sergeant Alan Bell is one of the detectives assigned to work the robbery. We had no suspects, positive, direct suspects in mind. Uh, we had done all of our usual checks, and we weren't able to come up with anybody that we could directly focus our investigation on. Two months later, the fat bandit strikes again. He's netting less than $3,000 a robbery. Police ask themselves, why risk so much for so little? Bank robbers are an unpredictable breed, according to criminologist Doug Skoog. Guys that rob banks are unusual guys. It's a very dangerous kind of crime to get involved in, uh, but they love the thrill, the tension before doing it, the kind of rush that they get when they go into a bank. They seem to like it, I think, because of that kind of adrenaline rush and the thrill that they get from it. So they continue to do it, oftentimes even when the rewards aren't that great. One week later, a police bulletin comes in. On January 13th, I received a fan out from the Vancouver Police Service with images, uh, captured images of a surveillance camera on the exterior of a bank that had been robbed in their jurisdiction on January 10th. Based on these images, police surmise it's the fat bandit. 
it's somewhat out of the ordinary. When we get people doing robberies in such a concentrated time frame, they're usually staying in the one location. Now we've got somebody who is basically cross Canada. The fat bandit is soon back in Winnipeg. Within three weeks, there are four more robberies. The city is on alert. Pressure's on police to catch him. The case is getting a lot of media attention. Each day that a bank is robbed, it makes the evening news. The video surveillance images the police now have are good enough to broadcast. Police hope the public will call in with tips. The tips lead nowhere. The fat bandit's identity remains unknown. Now, police fears are starting to mount. We were becoming frustrated um, because of, of the weapon and the increased frequencies. We were concerned that somebody was going to try to do something to stop them and somebody's going to get hurt. On February 7th, the fat bandit commits his seventh robbery in three months. But this time, a man who lives near the bank is able to tell police what he saw. An SUV pulled up. A man took off some clothes and threw them in the back. Then he changed the license plates and drove off. The witness never saw his face. Police now have a solid ID on his vehicle, a black Yukon. They know his height, his weight, what he drives. Police also have a geographic profile of his robberies. After the February 10th robbery, we determined that the suspect likes the southwest quadrant of the city. We suspect strongly that either he lives in that area or has some reason for committing crimes in that specific area of the city. Napier now has 40 undercover officers staking out banks in southwest Winnipeg, and another 10 officers cruising the area in unmarked cars. All we wanted to do at this point was find this individual and rip his mask off. February 14th, Valentine's Day. Suddenly the call came over the radio that uh, robbery had just occurred to a bank on Waterloo, which was out of our area. Detective Bell spots a large black SUV leaving the scene at high speed. He joins the chase. We were third unit in line, I guess, about a mile back from the vehicle. He got onto the perimeter highway, but suddenly he made another westbound turn off of the perimeter and went westbound on a dirt road. We were second unit in line behind a marked cruiser, just a basic single lane dirt road doing 160 to 180 kilometers an hour, and no signs of him slowing down whatsoever. The driver finally skids into a ditch. Police have him cornered. They know he's armed. He could be dangerous. Detective Bell orders him to give up his weapon and surrender. The fat bandit is about to be unmasked. Winnipeg police have finally caught up with the man responsible for at least eight armed robberies. His car doors are blocked by snow. His only way out is through the window. It's the moment they've been waiting for. But he's not what they expect. We looked at him and he could be anybody's uncle. And with his build, he could put a Santa suit on and he could be Santa at Christmas time. According to his ID, the fat bandit's real name is Klaus Berlikow. In the cruiser, he was extremely upset. He was crying. He said he was ashamed of what he had done, that this was going to ruin his family. He was quoting Shakespeare. I remember him quoting passages from Paradise Lost. 
At that point, I kind of realized that this wasn't your regular down and out bank robber. This guy had, you know, somewhat of a normal life at some point in time. It turns out Berlikow's life is anything but normal. Until a year ago, he was a well-known senior bureaucrat working for the city of Winnipeg. He helped organize many high-profile civic events, among them the Pan American Games. City councillor Harry Lazarenko has known Klaus Berlikow for 20 years. I was shocked. I thought that this was not the person. I thought it had to be another person with that name. He was in charge of the downtown festival with as many as 200 to 300,000 people. I'm saying that this man was capable. He was good at organizing. Police are baffled. How does someone go from making six figures a year to robbing banks? Berlikow begins to tell his story. It's difficult for me to explain how I got from that point to where I am here uh, today. When Berlikow stopped working for the city, he got a $170,000 severance package. He decided to reinvent himself as an events planner, focusing on Celtic music. I decided that the best opportunities uh, for that particular business would exist on the West Coast. Berlikow says he made contact with some venture capitalists who set him up with a business partner in Seattle. According to Berlikow, he met his new partner and handed over his life savings. The plan was to stage a series of concerts. Berlikow was excited. He was asked to transport concert merchandise across the border, but when he was also asked to transport drugs, Berlikow refused. I got involved with a world that, uh, and people that I couldn't have imagined and ended up way over my head. Berlikow says that when he refused to transport drugs, his partner lost money, which he now wanted repaid with interest. I liquidated everything that I had uh, in an attempt to pay them and uh, borrowed where I could. Failure to do so would, would have had some pretty serious consequences for me and uh, potentially for my family. These guys meant business. Berlikow needed money fast. It was then he decided to start robbing banks. There, there was a sense of disassociation. I, I really didn't think of myself as being the person doing this. When, when I was in there, I was terrified. Um, my heart was pounding, and, and when I left, there was an instant sense of remorse of, at having done it, shame of having um, put myself in a position where I felt that I, I needed to do this. Was Klaus Berlikow really robbing banks to protect his loved ones from mobsters and drug dealers? As police begin to investigate his story, they get a surprising call from a woman in Seattle. She says they've made a mistake. The man they have in custody is no bank robber. He's her business partner, Patrick Burke, an Irish millionaire. Kathy Taylor, a Seattle dental hygienist and mother of two, says she hasn't heard from her partner since Valentine's Day. We were terrified that something had happened to him. So we hit Winnipeg Sun, and the first thing that comes up on the screen is a picture of him and uh, ex-senior bureaucrat arrested for armed bank robbery. It has to be a mistake. You know, they've got the wrong picture with the article or something wrong. Winnipeg police assure her there's no mistake. About a half an hour after this conversation, the FBI calls my home and tells me 
that they need to meet with me because my partner just robbed several Canadian banks and they were afraid that he'd been robbing banks in Washington as well. I passed out. I fainted dead cold. Bank robber, senior civil servant, Irish millionaire. The pieces don't fit. Who is this guy, really? Former civil servant Klaus Berlikau has told Winnipeg police that he became a bank robber to pay back West Coast mobsters. Now, police learn he may have another identity. The information we receive from uh, this witness in Seattle, we take very seriously. Um, we act upon it and uh, try and establish if there's any credibility to the fact that he was using the alias Patrick Burke. Berlikau freely admits he traveled under an assumed name. Frankly, I've never been all that fond of my name. Uh, it's, it speaks to an ethnicity that I don't embrace. Berlikau won't talk to the police about Kathy Taylor, but Kathy Taylor is happy to talk about him. I met him in an online chat room, and I was moving through chat rooms of different countries, and I picked Ireland, and this, this person sent me an instant message, and his nickname was Tin Whistle. He's brilliant, and he is amazingly funny. I mean, I finally would turn him off sometimes and just get up for the computer and walk around and get away from it because I was dying. He's hysterical. First time we met was in a bar, and I had some friends sitting to the side because, you know, it's an internet thing. He told her all about his childhood in Northern Ireland, how he joined the IRA after his best friend was killed by stray bullets. Now, he said, he wanted to set up an events planning business in Seattle. He wanted Taylor to be his partner. He chose Seattle because it reminded him so much of his home in Ireland. The mist over the water and the, the mist through the forest. He had the cutest Irish accent. He was just a round, jolly little Irishman. But he told me one time that he could live in this rental hotel at $600 a night for the rest of his life and never be out of money. Police are shocked to learn Taylor was in Vancouver with her new partner the day he robbed a bank. On January 10th, he asked me to ride to Vancouver with him because he was going to meet with an investor. Well, I got upset and said, I'm going with you. I'm a partner in this company, and I'm going with you to meet with this investor. He said, no, you're not, because these are old school guys, and they don't want to have any woman involved in the business. He gave her his credit card and told her to go spend his money in the mall. And then later I found out that while I was shopping on his card, he robbed a bank. On the way back, he was fine. He was jovial and happy that he found some more investors and uh, things were moving right along with the business. Berlikau continues to insist that drug dealing mobsters were behind his crime spree. Taylor tells police she has her doubts. Every time he was here in Seattle, I was here, and I never saw any mob affiliation. Uh, what I'm saying is, is the truth, uh, to the extent that I can tell the truth uh, about this without endangering myself or my family, I, I have told the truth. He said, she said. Which story did the police believe? Criminologist Doug Skoog says he'd go with Taylor. If you look at Berlico's behavior, it shows this impulsivity, this egocentrism, this lack of concern for others. Skoog believes Berlikow is a pathological liar. The only person that they really love is themselves. And, you know, he found, you know, having this money and being able to throw it around uh, fun and enjoyable but I don't think for a moment that it was to save his family in Winnipeg. 
I think he was just unhappy and bored with his life, and he needed a really good life fix. The media just won't let go of the story. I was thinking, this is something like Jesse James. It was like getting into a soap opera. Every day, I'd be reading the paper, watching the television. The stories would be coming out day by day. I think the media got caught up in in what was indeed an interesting story, where you have a six-figure-a-year upper-middle-class individual robbing banks. But the error that the media makes, when a rich person is involved in crime, they try to find deep psychological you know, motivations. When poor people commit crime, they did it because they're greedy. Berlico robbed the banks because he was greedy. I felt satisfied that the uh, suspect had been arrested given the fact of uh, all the, the, the victim tellers that he had terrorized during his crime spree. At the end of the day, he was just another bank robber. All the evidence that police collected in the 72 hours after Berlikow's first bank robbery, the eyewitness accounts, the surveillance tapes, the clothing, has led to this moment. Klaus Berlikow pleaded guilty and was sentenced to eight years in jail. Oh my gosh, those inmates are gonna have a great time. Lots of laughs. He was the greatest storyteller I'll ever know. Berlikow has plenty of time to think about the stories he'll tell. When he's released from Canadian prison, he faces a series of similar charges in Washington state. stories on 72 hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. 